Hello, folks. This is Kent Hovind in Lenox, Alabama. We're about to do a debate live. I think this is the first one we've done live on our channel, isn't it, Steve? Well, we're getting better and better at this. We're in Lenox, Alabama, population 35. So thank you for joining us. I'm debating with uh, Matthew Bardos, an attorney from uh, Connecticut. He'll be introducing himself, and he gets to go first on the topic of is there intelligent design, evidence for intelligent design, or evidence for distilliology. In other words, there's no designer. So, Matthew, you get to go first, so take it away. Tell us why you think there's no designer, no purpose in life. Go ahead. Uh, excellent. So, hello, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hoven for allowing me to do this debate, and thanks, Steve, for uh, setting it up. So, intelligent design versus no design. So, my position is that nature is exactly what it appears to be, an unguided, amoral, natural process. Dr. Hovind is arguing that there is an intelligent designer for everything we see. Now, I'm going to first explain how uh, humans recognize intelligent design, uh, which is done by comparing objects to things that we are certain were intelligently designed. I will then explain some of the ways that uh, Ken's hypothesis fails, and I originally put I only have eight minutes. I guess we have a little more than that, but I'm trying to gonna hit some of the biggest points. So I've got three pictures here. I hope everyone can see those, pretty crude pictures, but I think they get the point across. So which of these things is not like the other? We have a hammer, a Yersinia pestis plague bacterium, and an engorged east or western black-legged deer tick. Now, I would say that of those three, I can clearly pick out the hammer as the one that sticks out as clearly designed, and I'm gonna tell you why. So, firstly, we could directly witness the object's manufacture, if we're so inclined. So, I suppose we could go to a hammer factory. Um, and I think Dr. Hoven would probably agree with this point. Uh, in many of his previous debates, I think this is his 171st debate, if I'm correct, he always argues that he loves direct observation. So that's a good way to tell if there's design. But I would ask Dr. Hovind, has he ever been to God's factory? Has he ever been to God's germ factory and watched God create a Yersinia pestis? No? Well, then we can't use that, can we? He, and sometimes I even put, sometimes you'll see the hammer stamp made in the USA with its manufacturer, even better. Never see that with a germ, never see that with a tick. So if we cannot witness the manufacturer of something, well, what is the next best thing? we can recognize its utility. So a hammer is used for driving in nails, but what is the utility of Yersinia pestis? I don't know, it's not apparent. Moreover, designed objects are typically standardized, unlike the endless variation of each individual rock or life form or everything we see on the planet. They don't appear to have come off an assembly line. Uh, it's very important, in fact, that objects are standardized so they don't break down and someone gets sued. Uh, but every, every organism seems to be an individual snowflake. So again, there's a disanalogy here. They do not appear, naturally occurring objects like rocks and germs do not appear to be at all like the hammer. But so let's compare this idea to Kent's hypothesis. Uh, in the beginning, uh, nothing said, let there be God. And this is Kent's designer. So first, absolute nothingness said, let there be a God. And a fully formed, invisible, trans-dimensional sky wizard, I guess with a beard, popped out of nowhere. Then in a real whirlwind of a six-day period, this particular deity named Je Yahweh or Jehovah, I know Kent doesn't like calling him that, whatever, this, this deity called God with a capital G, whatever it's called, uh, or some such thing, it just sat down at its desk and designed flesh-eating bacteria, childhood cancer, and tsetse flies, and then he called it good. And at some point on day six, after this new sky wizard was done making 400,000 species of beetles, venomous spiders, the Utah raptor, and gonorrhea, of course, he got around to making people. Uh, when he got around to people, he was clearly ready for his day off, but he powered through. He made sure people needed to drink fresh water after he filled 97% of the water on the earth with salt and filled most of the remaining 3% with intestinal parasites. I guess he figured we learned to boil it eventually. Then he said, and make sure that in addition to water and air, people also need at least 41 different macro and micronutrients and their short lives will be dependent on the trillions of microorganisms which will live in and on their bodies. Then he finally rested. So not only is this evidence of no design, I'm, I'm very curious uh, when uh, Kent gets his turn to talk, if he's going to retreat to the position of poor design. If he's gonna say, well, uh, no design versus an intelligent designer, okay, but how about, it? maybe it's just a bad design, but it's still an intelligent design. Well, I don't think that would work here, but I'd love to see if he's going to retreat to that position because his God is perfect. It doesn't make mistakes. Uh, his God is all powerful, meaning he has unlimited resources. He can do anything. He can make a perpetual motion machine, which wouldn't need to eat, for example. He doesn't need to run a cost-benefit analysis. 
if his God is all-knowing, he knows exactly how his uh, creations are going to turn out before he even makes them. So he knows how they're going to be right now. He knows how they're going to be down the road in a thousand years or a million years. Uh, and his God is all-loving. So he would want a perfect design that minimizes suffering. Now, nevertheless, I still, I'm still i arguing for no design. That's why I put let me be clear. But I'm simply showing that even poor design would win me this debate because uh, Kent would have to go back on what he said in all 170 previous debates if he worships a poor designer. But I'm, I'd love to see if he's willing to retreat to that position. Well, maybe we'll get there. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you some examples of why there's no intelligent design. And I could really go on forever. I'm going to try to make them quick. So first, exhibit A, Enterocus faecalis. It's a germ that is naturally present in the gut of most, if not all, humans. It is normally commensal, meaning it derives benefit from living inside of us, but confers no benefit to us. If it mutates or gets into parts of the body where it is not normally present, we get very sick and may die. Now, does that look like an intelligent, benevolent design to you? Keep in mind that E. faecalis is a totally separate organism, not an organ, not, not, like, an, not like our appendix. It's a separate organism just trying to survive itself. And if we die, so does it. Some design, huh? In the words of Leonardo da Vinci, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. But clearly, Kent's designer didn't get the memo. Uh, how about wisdom teeth? I've talked briefly uh, to Dr. Hoven about this on the phone very, before we got into this debate. I said, some people are born with less than four. Some people have none. So I guess the supposed designer couldn't make up his mind on these. No standardization. Most people are born with all four, and the chances that these will cause life-threatening infections due to impaction is high. Too bad there is no upside. We chew just uh, as well, if not better, without wisdom teeth, so they confer no benefit. But the wide variation among who has wisdom teeth and how many shows that, the, again, there's a complete lack of standardization there. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's something, again, what we see in designed objects. Again, the, the designer seems like he can't make up his mind. How about this one? I've never heard this one really argued. Back hair, body hair in general, but back hair specifically. It's good for the goose, it's good for the gander is my question on this one. So only some men, human men, have thick, dark back hair, and almost no women on the planet do. Now, the amount of back hair in men varies widely, from being completely covered to scattered patches to none. Again, I guess God can't do it, standardize his design, can't make up his mind. Back hair offers no benefit, but it causes potential harm through entrapping harmful bacteria on the skin. It's often considered unsightly, and th thus creating asymmetries, potentially reducing chances of mating. And if it does have some unknown benefit, as I think Kent might try to argue, then why don't women have it? Why only men? And why only some men? That doesn't make any sense, does it? It's wide variation in men, non-existence in women, it suggests no beneficial use for the trait, and yet there it is. So how about this for an intelligent design? There's a 99.9% .9 failure rate. 99.9% .9 of all species that have lived are now extinct. If they were designed, then a designer gets an F minus. Uh, and there's, I even have a link for that. Uh, how many stars and galaxies are long gone before we could even become aware of their existence? If they were designed for us. Why are they already gone by the time we got here? I guess this particular God didn't care whether we ever got to see them at all, or, uh, but at least we get to see the distant starlight from some of them that are already gone. Uh, and the design is disproportionate to the designer. So Ken's hypothesis, after the creation in Genesis, Yahweh, or whatever he calls them, only seems to care about the Earth and certain people on it. There is no mention of all the uninhabited planets and moons in our star system, nor why the... Is that time? I've got a couple more slides. That's okay. That's eight minutes, but keep going. All right, I'm just about done. Uh, there's no mention of all the uninhabited planets and moons in our star system, nor why they're barren, and certainly no mention of the countless other galaxies in the observable universe. There is no mention of the 99% of the universe that is a lifeless void. Seems like a lot of wasted space to me. Saying that the observable universe was designed to only contain the Earth is like saying that 600 trillion Olympic-sized swimming pools were created to contain a single molecule of water. Does that sound like design to you? In the words of Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, the stage is too big for the drama. It's way too big, if you ask me. Uh, why would the omnipotent designer of the cosmos care about goat sacrifices from the Israelites? Does that sound proportional to you? That would be worse than if I created a planet Earth and everything on it, then afterwards all I cared about were a handful of bacteria in one particular puddle at one point in time in the middle of Borneo. To continue the hammer analogy, it would be equivalent to creating the world's largest hammer factory but then only making one hammer. Why did the designer only reveal himself to the Israelites and hide from everyone else? 
either he uh, either he would want to be known or he doesn't. Uh, why won't he choose? Uh, this really is an extraordinary hypothesis that Ken is proposing. I hope his evidence is just as extraordinary. I've got two more slides. So I don't want to. I'm going to make sure that there's uh, we don't forget Occam's razor. You got a real Occam's razor problem here. I, this slide I think tells it all. You got nothingness, universe, two steps. Compared to nothingness, a guy with a beard, a fully formed, fully coalesced wizard, and then the universe. Well, which does Occam's razor prefer? Which is the more parsimonious explanation? Clearly the first one. So just to recap, this is my last slide. We did not witness any deity, designer, create anything. But ironically, Kent is supposed to love direct observation and empiricism. The universe is full of objects which lack apparent utility and standardization, unlike designed objects. If everything was designed, then how can you possibly recognize design as you have no ability to compare and contrast? Uh, Kent, in one of his recent debates, talked about finding an arrowhead in a forest. But you think the rocks, the trees, the dirt, the ticks, the germs, the leaves in that forest were also designed, so you wouldn't be able to pick the arrowhead out. Kent's designer is also perf a perfect designer, meaning even evidence of poor design refutes his argument. I don't know if he's going to retreat to that position or not. We'll see. The design and the designer are completely disproportionate in relation to one another, and having, design having a designer is disfavored by Occam's razor and is far less parsimonious explanation than uh, no designer at all. Uh, thank you very much. That's my last slide. All right. Well, thank you, sir. You took about, let's see, um, 11 minutes, but that's fine. I, I, I don't like the... I don't like the clock at all. I'll try to keep it roughly similar. Okay. Well, thank you, Matthew, for joining us. I understand you're an attorney in Chicago. You're, I mean, in Connecticut. You're arguing for the position of dysteleology, which is a fancy word that means there is no design, there is no purpose to life here on the planet. Okay. Dysteleology is a philosophical view that ex existence has no telos, no final cause, no for purposeful design. Can't read that slide. That's okay. This is straight from Wikipedia. Ernst Haeckel is the one who invented this word. I find it very amusing that atheists, such as yourself, or I don't know if you're an atheist, uh, Matthew, but you argue against design using ar you can arguments that you designed. You, de you designed the arguments that you, that you just gave in the last 11 minutes to argue against designer. Here's the history behind this, uh, <clears throat> this teleology. James Hutton made up the idea of uniformitarianism, and his idea had a great impact on Charles Lyell, who was an attorney from Scotland. James Hutton said the earth may be millions of years old. Uh, the blasphemous geologist who rocked our understanding of Earth's age, James Hutton from the Smithsonian.com. Charles Lyell, then the attorney, made up the geologic column, which we use today uh, in textbooks to teach the kids the earth is millions of years old. Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland who had a particular hatred for the Bible. And he wrote three volumes called Principles of Geology back in 1830. He said his goal was to free the science, talking about geology, to free the science from Moses. Because at this time, most people thought that all of the strata and layers of the earth could be explained by a flood in the days of Noah. But Charles Lyell made up this geologic column, and everybody began teaching, wow, the earth is millions of years old, and the layers are different ages. Now, the whole thing is baloney. It doesn't exist anywhere on the world. But Ernst Haeckel was strongly influenced by this. Ernst Haeckel, the man who coined the word, Dysteleology, and there is no purpose to life. Ernst Haeckel also had a particular hatred for biblical Christianity. He said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book, Origin of Species, which was translated to German in 1860. Haeckel read that, changed his life. And by 1868, most evolutionists were worried that there was no evidence for Darwin's theory. Darwin had said, we should find evidence for my theory. And nine years later, there was still none. So Ernst Haeckel one of those many worried evolutionists, determined to manufacture some. He created some phony evidence. This began in 1868. Haeckel was drawing a family tree for mankind. This is still used in textbooks today. Okay. See, Steve, are we off screen here? Are we Are getting it all? Yeah. My, my camera show is not quite getting it all, but okay. What, what, what uh, do you mean? Look in the camera lens here. In the camera. Okay. Not there, the camera. Okay. Haeckel became worried about the large gap between non-living and living organisms, so he, to complete this gap, he invented an organism called the Monera, of which there is no example at all. 1869, Huxley claimed to have discovered these organisms, and he named them Bathybius Haeckel, uh, Haeckel in honor of Ernst Haeckel, and uh, they revealed there was next simply calcium. There was no such thing. 
But Hinkle reached an all-time low when he made the biogenetic law called the Law of Recapitulation. He's best known for the famous statement, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. He's also, on the other hand, Haeckel also stated that politics is applied biology. Now, this is the quote the Nazis used. We're just applying biology by eliminating the inferior, which would be to them, the Jews and the blacks. They hated black people. Uh, Haeckel taught that each animal retraces the stages of its evolution in the embryonic development. And he made up the idea that the embryo has gill slits. Now, he was an excellent artist, uh, but he was also a bold-faced liar. Haeckel made drawings of a human and a dog embryo at a certain stage in their development. Uh, on top is actual photographs. Below are his drawings. Haeckel's fake drawings, proven to be fake in 1874. Haeckel's fake drawings are still used today in textbooks. This has been proven wrong for 100 years. Haeckel was tried at his own university, uh, the court in Jena. The, oh, you've got a glare on the screen. Uh, in Jena University, he was convicted of fraud. He confessed and said, well, I made up some of these drawings. He finally confessed. He said, I should feel utterly condemned if it were not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. His excuse was, everybody lies, therefore I can lie. But Haeckel's idea, who made up this uh, distilliology word, there's no designer. His idea of development being evidence for evolution is still used in textbooks today. It is a worldwide phenomena, a tragedy, that this is being taught. This is what helped convince Darwin that all life forms shared a common ancestor. So Haeckel and uh, Lyle and Darwin worked together on these things to develop our current theory of evolution in the textbooks, which is the only alternative I'm aware of that's ever been offered to an idea of a designer. So if there's no designer, you're stuck with the question, how did we get here? And I, would, I don't know if anybody has ever come up with another answer besides evolution. Darwin considered this idea of the embryo having gill slits as the strongest evidence in favor of his theory. Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. And it's not true. He lied, deliberately lied. He made up the phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. He also made up the phrase, distilliology. But this is still taught in textbooks worldwide. I've been over this many times. He made up the phrase, distilliology. Now, no final cause, no purpose for, you don't think there's any cause. You're a lawyer, you know about evidence. I used this in the debate the other day. There are many different kinds of evidence. Actually, there are 15 different kinds. We have written evidence, uh, documental evidence. The Bible claims that God created the world. He claims he did it in six days. That's what he claims. Uh, and it says, in the beginning, God created the earth. And the Bible says Jesus created all things, which is one of hundreds of verses that teach from the scriptures, at least, that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. Jesus said that he which made them at the beginning, <clears throat> made them male and female. And that was Adam and Eve from Mark 10, 6. That was the beginning of the creation. And the Bible clearly teaches man brought sin and death into the world. Now, most of your arguments, Matthew, was trying to argue that there's bad things in the world. Therefore, God must have made these bad things. I think the Bible clearly teaches that God made a perfect world and man brought death and sin into the world. By man came death. In Adam, all die. So you're bl this is like seeing a wrecked car in the junkyard and trying to blame the manufacturer for building a wrecked car. You're seeing it after it was destroyed. We, you and I are seeing the creation that is under a curse, and it's, it's got a lot of problems. I agree. But I think there's an answer to all of those bacteria questions if we don't take time to get into all of that. Uh, the Bible says Adam was the first man, and Eve's the mother of all living. And you get the dates in Genesis 5 and make a chart. The Bible teaches the earth is about 6,000 years old and was created in six literal 24-hour days. But the Bible warned us that in the last days there would be scoffers, such as yourself, Matthew, who walk after their own lusts and say, where is the promise of his coming? It says in verse 5, they are willingly ignorant of the creation and willingly ignorant of the flood in verse 6 and willingly ignorant of the coming judgment of God. The Bible clearly claims God made the world, man messed it up. There came a big flood, which really messed it up. And much of the damage we see on the planet today is a result of this flood. But God's going to fix it all. And I did give the arrowhead example. I think it's pretty obvious. Somebody made the arrowhead. And you said, but there's also germs in the forest, so I couldn't pick it up. I'll go ahead and pick up an arrowhead if I see one. I'm not afraid of the germs. Many different kinds of evidence. In my debate yesterday, I went through this. And as a lawyer, I'm sure you're aware of all these different kinds of evidence that can be used. Character evidence, circumstantial, demonstrative, digital, Bible codes. We went over that yesterday. 
I think there's digital evidence, certainly, that God created the world. Let's see, let me get through all of this forensic evidence, hearsay. I find it very amusing, again, as I mentioned, that you're using arguments against design by designing arguments. Uh, the Bible says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against people who uh, hold the truth in unrighteousness. That which may be known of God is manifest. God has showed it to them. I think you know, Matthew, there's a designer. I'll show you in a minute. We can understand by the creation that there was a creator. You can understand by the arrowhead, there was an arrowhead manufacturer. But they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. For some reason, they don't want to admit there's a God. They profess themselves to be wise. The Bible says in Hebrews, every house is builded by some man, and he that built all things is God. God is claiming he did it. If you find a ghost town out west, as I mentioned, you would right away know somebody made this, even if there's nobody there. Somebody made it. The heavens declare the glory of God. So I have a question for you viewers and for Matthew. Does this screw show evidence of intelligent design for a purpose? Does this nail show evidence of intelligent design for some purpose? Does this coil of nails, does that show intelligent design for some purpose? Does this cabinet show intelligent design? Does a house show intelligent design? Does the space shuttle show intelligent design? Does the human body show intelligent design for a purpose? Does a single cell from a plant, which is a trillion times more complicated than a space shuttle, does that show intelligent design? Does the eyeball of a human or any animal for that matter show any evidence of intelligent design? Can't you see? You could look at a nail and say somebody designed that. Can't you see there's a designer for the eye or the ear or the heart or the ecosystems or the solar system? What makes Earth so perfect for life? There are many, many things, hundreds of factors that light Earth is designed for life. Now, why the other planets? Why the wasted real estate? Maybe just like they put chrome on a car. Does absolutely nothing, but it makes people say, oh, wow, that looks pretty. Maybe it's to get us to say, wow, what a mighty God we serve. Or maybe there's a future purpose for this. Maybe there's a future purpose for the planets. I don't know. But I can pick up a bolt like this and say, wow, this nut is designed to screw onto this bolt. And this wrench is designed to fit the nut. I don't have a problem with that. And that is so primitive compared to the design seen all over nature. Yes, Matthew, there's an intelligent designer. Distilliology is a useless futile teaching philosophy of belief, it's useless. There's evidence, overwhelming evidence for a designer. Now, if there are problems in nature, maybe man caused those. Maybe we cause our own problems. If you run out of gas, don't blame General Motors to go for running out of gas. If you run into a tree and smash your car, don't blame GM. They didn't smash it. Maybe you caused the problems for your own health. That's another, we'll take that up another time. Let's see, dismiss, good, okay. That's my theory that I think that it's overwhelming evidence there's a designer. Now, who is it? Is it Allah, Buddha, Jehovah? That's a different set of arguments, but there's a designer, which is the purpose of this debate. Go ahead, Matthew. Uh, he needs to unmute himself. Oh, unmute yourself, Matthew. You're still muted. Uh, top of the screen. Hit top of the screen. Hit mute button. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, good. So just a, just a formatting question. So can we kind of do it back and forth now? Is that all right with you? I, I know it doesn't. Sure, sure. Yep, now. go ahead. Okay, perfect. So firstly, just, a, just a, a correction to point out, I didn't say you couldn't pick up the arrowhead because of germs, I said you couldn't pick it out because everything to you is designed. You have no ability to contrast it with the dirt on the ground, the rocks on the ground. You, so Wait a minute. I can't tell an arrowhead from a germ or dirt? Yeah. You I believe, think I can't. Do you believe the dirt and germs are designed? Yes. Do you believe the arrowhead's designed? Yeah, the arrowhead was designed by man. Well, so... And okay, that's perfect. So how can you tell the difference? I think all of human experience, we will be able to easily tell a screw or a nut or a bolt is designed by a person, as opposed to the iron that this screw is made out of was designed by God. And then we can dig the iron ore out and smelt it down and add some chromium or, or, or different other metals and uh, elements, nickel or something like that, and make a screw. It's designed. A, a kindergartner would tell you this is designed. A kindergartner would tell you the arrowhead was designed. The dirt was also designed, but not by man. That was designed by God. Well, uh, what I'm asking is how do you distinguish? What are the characteristics of a designed object for you? Because I, list, I listed how I do it again. So number one is watch it, maybe manufactured directly, or look at it, see if it has a stamp on it. You don't have that with dirt. Number two is what is it, or a rock? Uh, what is its usefulness? What is its utility? What is the utility of a rock? You don't have that. Number three is oh, standardization. One, 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 
What is the utility of dirt or a rock? Have yeah. you ever done any gardening? All the plants in the world are growing in dirt. We need dirt. Dirt is a very use has a very a lot of utility for dirt. How about, for, how about Yersinia pestis in the tick? How about what now? How about a rock or Yersinia pestis and the and the deer tick? The three that I listed are the, the next to the hammer. You don't think there's any utility for a rock? They use them all the time for all sorts of construction purposes. They use them for building materials. They use them for highways. Do you drive on the highway? All the, the rocks that are buried underground, all those boulders, what are, what are they being used for currently? That's the foundation. I bet there's foundations under your house that you probably never have seen. I and bet they poured concrete and built the house on top and covered it with dirt. And yeah, now yeah. it's holding your house up. How about Yersinia pestis plague bacteria? What is the utility of that? Your, the, the germ that causes bubonic plague, what is its utility? I think most germs, the human body can handle it if the human body is healthy. Uh, most of the problems are really a lack of uh, nutrition or uh, problems in our human body. It's resistance to those diseases. You might want to call Bill Sardi. He's one of our trustees, uh, knowledgeofhealth.com. I don't think that a lot of people did not get the bubonic plague. I think if you look at the sanitation conditions that went through Europe at that time and killed a third of the population, they had lousy sanitation, lousy drinking water. They didn't know about germs. So they really caused their own problem. God told his people, the Jews, way back in the book of Exodus, to wash their hands after they touch a dead body. They had no clue why. He just said, when you touch a dead body, wash your hands and don't touch anybody else till sundown. They did it, most of them. And wow, they didn't catch the bubonic plague. But and those doctors who were handling the body. The question, the question is, and the question for this debate is, did your deity design the organism that causes the bubonic plague? I think you designed the organisms. They may have mutated or changed. Like you can take a hammer and use it for evil purposes. You You're, can probably modify a hammer. To the question. I asked if he designed the bubonic plague bacteria, yes or no. I don't, I don't know if it's that particular bacteria. Okay, so but you don't know. So the debate is over. You have no idea what you're talking about. So therefore, because I don't know if he designed a bacteria, therefore there's no designer? Wait, do you use this logic well, in court? Because I, we, no, because we're doing any cases at all. <laughs> what we are doing is comparing it to the hammer. We both agree the hammer is designed, but you have no clue about the germ, but you think it's designed anyway, but you can't tell me why or how. Can, can a hammer be used for evil purposes? Have you ever seen anybody killed with a hammer? Sure. Okay. Can a hammer be used for good purposes? Sure. Yeah, I used one today. Okay. So... I think that because I don't know all the utility, all the purposes of the germ, the bubonic plague, maybe it serves a useful purpose in some other organism, and it's just harmful and for humans. Or maybe's. What's that? Like, you know, it's ifs, ands, buts, or maybe's, but you don't know. Unlike the hammer. You. I'm sure it made somebody else. Know. I know what a hammer is used for. I know it was, I could go to a hammer factory right now and watch it be designed. Have you ever been to God's germ factory? That was my first question. I know. I did not see the creation. I take that on faith. Ah. Do, you take, do you take it on faith that there's no designer? That's a negative concept. But well, let's break that down. That's great. So faith, uh, how do you define that? Because I define that as belief without evidence. I, I define that as something that often gets people put into nut houses because they believe something in contrary to the evidence or without any evidence at all. Well, I, I would be willing to bet a steak dinner that you believe all kinds of things you cannot prove. You believe in gravity. Can you give me a jar of gravity, please, and paint it red? You can show me what it does. Can you tell, can you tell me what it is? You're showing me what it does. You, define, like you define things by their characteristics. Gravity is an attractive force. I just demonstrated it. Yeah, you're showing me what it does, but you're not telling me what it is. Give me you a jar of gravity. By their characteristics. It's an attractive so, force. Have you, have you ever seen, not the effects, but have you ever actually seen gravity itself? What is this force you're, you're demonstrating? It. What is the force of gravity? Give me a jar of it and paint it red. I'd like to see that. We define things by their characteristics. It is an attractive force, and I just demonstrated it. Okay, can you demonstrate things? Are there such things as love, emotions as hatred, or envy, or jealousy? Are they real? Where do they exist? Give me a jar of that. I don't even know, exactly? I don't understand the question. What do you mean, what are, they, are they real? Is there such a thing as love, or hatred, or envy, or jealousy? Are those, are those real? Are emotions real? I mean, yes, I guess. Where are they? What do they look like? How much do they weigh? Okay, what is the point you're trying to get at with this question? Let's get cut to the chase. Who manufactured love or hatred or envy? Who manufactured the emotions? Where's the factory? No I want to go see that factory. No one. That's why I'm arguing for no design. So no one designed the human emotions, love, envy. Most other animals don't have these kind of things. 
jealousy, hatred, et cetera, like that. So nobody designed that, the emotions of the human. Why would you think that someone would? Well, right. you're, diverting, you're diverting the question, typical lawyer maneuver here. I ask you, where's the factory where these things are made? Who designed them? We ever, obviously people have these emotions. I'm arguing, you admit that they have them. I'm arguing for non-design in nature. So, oh, they're not really a jealousy, brotherhood. None of those emotions are designed. They just are, are what a natural product of, of the. And are we just animated meat? Yes. Are, are you nothing but you're nothing but animated meat? Yes. And guess what? I don't care about what's palatable. I care about what's true. Unfortunately, the truth might hurt sometimes. I, I care about what's true too. It's really? true. It's true. I can look at this and say, wow, each component of this was designed. I don't have to see the designer. Okay, I know well, there's there's a, a tick, a, a tick. Uh, we already agreed that that's designed. I want a na something that we well, think that maybe, 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 maybe ticks, go through ticks, it. May serve, ticks may serve a very useful purpose to some other animals. I don't know. Certainly they're useful to each other. The fact maybe. that I don't know the use of them, therefore, I bet I could show you tools in our shop that you have no idea what they're for. Does that prove they're not designed? I this have other ways. Method. That's why I told you. I've got other ways to do it. I can witness its manufacture. I can look if it has a stamp on it. I can see if it's standardized. I don't just have one way. Those are all sufficient ways to do it. They're, none of them are necessarily necessary, but they're sure. all sufficient. There are probably lots of ways to go back and find out what is the purpose of this particular bacteria. For back in 18 or 1920, they had a list of 180 vestigial organs. They did not think the human body needed the tailbone or the tonsils or the adenoids. They had a whole list of 180 things. It wasn't that they didn't need it, it's they didn't know the use of it. The fact that you don't know the use of a tick or the, some bacteria in nature, nature is pretty complicated. It's a big world out there. And maybe there's a use someplace else, but not right here. Maybe if it gets in the wrong place, it'll do the wrong thing. If a hammer gets inside your skull, it's gonna do some bad things. But if a hammer's in your hand pounding a nail, it can do some good things. So maybe the human body was designed to be resistant to these bacteria. And if you take the right and wash your hands, get away from, don't the doctors avoid some of the germs by simply washing their hands, which God told his people to do 3000 years ago. I don't know which particular bacteria uh, was created and maybe it's a mutant of that. There are, you can take a hammer, sharpen it down and make it turn it into an ax. That wasn't what it was designed for. It was been modified. Sure, mutations happen, and we are seeing the junkyard of the creation after it was destroyed by man's sin and destroyed by a flood. Other people are doing these bad things to people. You can't blame God for all these things. Germs aren't people. Okay. Do you blame them? Do you do you do these same arguments against the Muslims and their God because they believe oh, in a God? So you uh, oh, absolutely. Okay, so have you, have you debated any Muslims and told them that their God is foolish and their Allah was not a prophet of God because- I sure have, have. I sure have. Yay. And you're still alive to tell about it. Good, wonderful. Well, because I did it in the United States. You did it oh, anonymously? In the United States. <laughs> okay, so, so your, well, argument, well, your, your religion a couple hundred years ago was impaling people and burning them alive, but you know, we can ignore that. Um, uh, in fact, your religion during the Black Plague, uh, they tried everything. They tried flagellants, you know, they, they thought it was alignment of the stars. Oh, that's, Great that's stuff. Not, Matthew, that's not my religion. My religion oh. is biblical Christianity. You're talking about Catholics in that case. Your religion is the one responsible for Adolf Hitler saying, we got to kill off these inferiors because we got to speed up the evolution process. Your religion is responsible, evolution is a religion, and it's responsible for communism. Oh, and atheism. Those are two different concepts. And what is it? Evolution and, and atheism are two different concepts. Neither of them are a religion. One is a scientific concept about how organisms change over time, which you keep wanting to talk about, but I'm trying to move away from that because it's not the topic. And okay. atheism is a religion like off as a TV channel. But okay, uh, so your argument is there's no intelligent designer because there are some things you don't understand. No, 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 no. that's not my sure. argument. You don't understand the bacteria in the tick. I'll, I'll, let me talk now. You keep using the courtroom analogy. You've admitted you don't know the purpose of these things numerous times already. So if we went into a courtroom, I, I practice civil law, so it's all about preponderance of the evidence. And I list the hammer, and I say, we both agree this is designed. And then you list your things, the tick and the germ. And you say, I have no idea what the purpose of these things is. I've got the preponderance of the evidence. You've just lost the case because you say, I don't know, judge. If you were going to say, bring in as evidence the, the germ as evidence against a designer, I would do some research and find out, wow, what does this germ do? Many bacteria serve useful purposes for digestion or for breaking down uh, for in, in the recycling process of the whole planet. There are some bacteria that do really good in the dirt, but you don't want them in your body. There are all kinds of things you want in nature that you don't want in your body. I bet you don't want the hammer in your body. 
So, so a perfect the, designer it, created the body, body. Damn it. Come on, man. This is silly. No, you're you're the one silly. There are babies right now with flesh eating bacteria killing them. Right now. Is, in the is there a cause? Is there a cure for flesh eating bacteria? Only sometimes. Is there a reason some people get it and some don't? Is there a natural immunity? Is there a lack? Is, is our government spraying things like chemtrails? The question causing this? is, did your God create it at all? If, if you kill one person, you save a thousand, you're going to prison. Okay. Did your God create this germ at all? Oh, I don't know. If, if my God created bacteria, which I believe he did, they serve a very useful purpose. You could not live without 10,000 different kinds of bacteria in your gut to digest the food. Bacteria are wonderful. Now, some of them can get out of hand, but if they're kept in balance with nature and you, you want some, you don't want too many. And maybe the flesh eating bacteria is designed to eat the flesh as it dies. Your skin regenerates itself every seven to 28 days, depending where it is on your body, seven on the palm of your hand, 28 on your face. So maybe somebody needs to eat those dead skin cells. And as long as it's kept in balance, it's fine. The, jump, the man comes and dumps our trash once a week, gets the dumpster. I don't want him coming every day and just picking up everything and dumping it, but I do want him to dump the trash. That's a useful thing for the garbage truck. It would not be useful if he started sticking those forks in the buildings and dumping them. So if there's a bacteria that I don't understand the current use of it, maybe there is one. I just don't know. But if you were going to use that as evidence, Mr. Matthew, I would do some research and find the answer for you. If I found an answer to that one, you would accept it. You would go on to 30 more bacteria. You wouldn't accept that. You don't want there to be a designer. That's your problem. I, gave, I started this with three examples for this very purpose. Hammer, Yersinia pestis plague bacteria, not just bacteria writ large, Yersinia pestis plague bacteria, and deer tick. And I want to know if your God created those three things, one, two, or all three. And I also just need to point out, you keep saying bacteria are good. I'm pretty sure that germs have killed more people men, women, and innocent children than anything, than Hitler, than all of it. Uh, no, you're, you are probably correct. The germs have done enormous damage to the planet, most of it to people who were susceptible to those germs. Many people uh, get the same germs in their body or on their body and are not affected by it because they have a natural immunity. Freezing has killed a lot of people, but it's not killed the people that are properly dressed. And if you have the right nutrients and vitamins, call Bill Sardi, knowledgeofhealth.com, and say, what is this bacteria? What's, what's the, how do you prevent this thing from harming you? Oh, you know, for years, they, they, people died of scurvy. Oh, they thought God is evil for creating this thing that's causing scurvy. No, it's a lack of vitamin C. You're not eating the fruit. So it's, a, it's man's diet causing his problem in most cases, a lack of something. If you don't get enough food, you're going to die of starvation. Is that God's fault because you died of starvation? Yes, it's God's fault if he made us require the vitamin C in the first place. Oh, so you blame God for everything, don't you? When did you oh, acquire this? God. Matthew, when did you acquire this hatred for God? I, I'm curious. Objection, Your Honor. That's a non sequitur. How could I hate a fictional creature? Okay, when did you acquire this hatred for the idea that uh, there's a creator or that there's a designer? Have I said I hated this idea? Well... I think your whole uh, the purpose of this debate. No, you don't, no. You, when did you acquire this desire to prove that there's no designer? Did this teleology? When did oh, you I'll start? I'll start well, now that I've got an answer to. So my okay. friend is an elementary school teacher. She's very concerned. I won't say her name. She's very concerned about uh, the path uh, that we're taking in this country in terms of science education. People trying to teach creationism in schools. I've seen a number of your videos. Ah, uh, okay. I've seen that quite a few of your videos, in fact, where you say that you, you don't want it taught in schools. That's you, you say in every single video, except at the beginning of the video, you say, bring your students down to dinosaur adventure land for a field trip. And I've never heard you say, but this only applies to private and religious schools. Not, not once. Oh, because it doesn't. Public schools are welcome to come. We encourage them. I hope they do. Okay. Thousands, thousands of teachers across the country. I hope I shouldn't tell you this, Matthew. They're, put, they're playing my videos in their public school classroom for their kids. Right. I think it bothers me that people who believe they came from a rock are teaching public school. It bothers me that teacher who think, people who think they're related to an amoeba are allowed to teach in our public school. That bothers me. It bothers me that they're using 75 lies to teach that stupid theory. The lies in the textbooks, that bothers me. I don't care if you want to teach your theory, but don't lie about it. The human embryo does not have gill slits. The tailbone is not vestigial. The earth is not billions of years old. The geologic column does not exist. There are 75 lies in the textbook. Stop teaching the lies. I'm not trying to force my religion on all the kids. I think if kids could see all the evidence 
and get a fair trial here, they would choose creation. Well, let me ask, you, let's talk about that. I let, let's let me sure. ask. So if you had children and you could you had two worlds that you could create for them. Option one is the world as it exactly is now. And option two is a world without bubonic plague. And then you put your children down on the planets. Which of the two planets do you pick? Well, I think that's a false analogy because if bubonic plague was caused by the black, the people doing unsanitary conditions like the open sewers and the streets, I, if I was God, if I was God who designed that, I would give the people a book and tell them, even if they didn't have a microscope for the first 4,000 years, say, guys, when you touch a dead body, wash your hands. Follow my rules and you'll live a long time. Exodus 15, he said, if you'll obey all my commandments, you'll have no diseases. I would give the people the commandments. They don't have to understand it. Just like you tell your kid, don't walk out in the street. He doesn't understand about cars. He doesn't need to. Just follow daddy's orders. Don't walk out in the street. And God well, gave very clear commands. Answer. You didn't answer the question, which of the two worlds you'd pick for your children? The one without bubonic plague or the one with it? Well, that, that's a rabbit trail. I would, get, I would want my kids to grow up in a world where they're allowed to examine all the evidence. You don't want kids to even see the evidence for creation. You, you want them to be isolated from that in public school. You're not going to answer the question? I would want my children to grow up in a world where they can see all the truth. If there's a bubonic plague, that because they don't wash their hands or they have open sewers or stuff like that, I would want a God who would warn them by writing a book saying, guys, don't do these certain things. Don't drive your car into a tree or you're going to smash it. It's not, it's not God's fault. It's not the tree's fault. It's your fault. You drove it into the tree. And you're, 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 you're you're silly. Silly. you haven't answered it. You are desperate to, give an, to, get, to find some evidence for no designer with a silly argument. You can't answer my question. You, you, it's been a lot of yes, no's, and maybes, and skirting. I've asked you a yes or no question. This is time number four. You have a child. You got two worlds: the world exactly as it is now, or the world exactly as it is now without bubonic plague. And you're going to let your child onto one of those planets. Which do you choose? I would choose the world exactly as it is now and give them an instruction manual of the things to watch out for. And the Bible is the perfect instruction manual for perfect health. God said to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter one, first chapter, eat the fruit, the vegetables, and the seeds. Cultures all over the world that eat the seeds to the fruit don't get cancer. You can't blame cancer on God. He told him in the first chapter to eat the seeds. So <laughs> I think that. that right. stuff. So you're, you're taking analogies of people disobeying or, or ignoring or not understand. If you don't change the oil in your car, you're going to blow the motor. Don't blame General Motors for that. You think they the people got the on purpose? What now? You think the people got caught the plague on purpose? I think they got, think they got the plague because of their lack of sanitary conditions. Okay, so if I had a child, I would put them on the planet without the bubonic plague so that they wouldn't have a chance of catching it by accident. You see, that's the more merciful and logical and reasonable thing to do. You would say, oh, well, I'll, I'll, give, you some, I'll give you a chance of catching it, but don't worry, I'm going to give you an instruction manual too. That's okay. I'll we'll get father of the year with that one. Your question has been asked and answered. Uh, I think I would put them on the planet as is and give them an instruction manual. Say, you do these things and you'll have no diseases, Exodus 15. Read the chapter. All right, so let's get back to the main topic. I don't know how much time we have left. I'm still really interested because you think that everything is designed. You think some things are designed by man, some things are designed by God. I want to know how you differentiate. Well, I think things designed by man are intuitively obvious. I can look at an ink pen and say, this is designed by man. Now, man used natural materials that, to make it probably used hydrocarbons out of the earth, which came from oil, which came from people and animals that drowned in Noah's flood. So I think this wrench right here, three quarter inch wrench, box 12 point on one end, open on the other end, says China, drop forged in China. I've never been to China, but I, this is enough evidence for me to believe there's a factory over there making these wrenches. I don't have to go see it. I believe, I, I take it on faith, there's a Chinese wrench factory. I can see, uh, a human body, I can see the eye, the ear, the nose, I can study, I taught biology 15 years, you can study any system in the humans and say, wow, there's a really smart designer. The guy who designed the ink pen is pretty smart. He made the cap where it'll snap onto both ends and it won't fall off. Look at that, snaps on here or snaps on here. Wow, that was good thinking. Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. And when I see a body that's designed to resist all these diseases, many of these bacteria have useful functions somewhere else they just, you don't want them in your gut. Just like the hammer has a useful function, but you don't want it in your head. That's not, it's just common sense, Matthew. I don't you understand. Know, I, I, I'm looking it. for an exact reason. So again, so you talked about the factory and the st stamp. We don't have that on our body. So that's out, right? We didn't directly observe humans being created by God. So that's all out, direct observation, right? 
direct observation of creation is out. Now, we do have an eyewitness, though, who was there, and he wrote a book about it. So I have an eyewitness account. God himself wrote a book and told us how he did it. So I have documentary Your evidence. Honor, hearsay? Hearsay, Your Honor? What's that now? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. You think the Bible is hearsay? They're, they're, the people who wrote it aren't here to be cross-examined. That's they're, they're by definition hearsay. So are there any court cases, one, where there's a document by that is accepted by people who've died? Uh, if, if somebody writes a last will and testament and they die, now their last will and testament's no good because they're not there to, to verify There are about 14 exceptions to the hearsay rule. I'll buy you the steak dinner if you can list me the one that the Bible would fall under. I don't know what those rules are. I'm not a lawyer. Praise okay. God for that. Well, no. hearsay is admissible in 14 different circumstances, but it's inadmissible in any other circumstance. And I don't think a 6,000-year-old book written by an author who we don't even know who would be admissible in court. Okay. Well, I know this has changed a lot of lives, including mine, and he wants to change yours, Matthew. He'd love to come inside your heart and change you into a new person. Do you know why we have rules of evidence in court? Because if they're not followed, people could go to the electric chair. So the, the, the burdens of evidence in court are perhaps even higher than scientific burdens because of what's on the line. So your book would not be admissible. So that's out. So direct okay. observation, the main way we figure out design is out. So I want to know what your next best way is to compare the pen to the human body and say that those things are both designed. Well, that's why I, I showed pictures of some different things from the human body, the eye, the ear, the heart, the body itself. Can you give any explanation for how that came without a designer? How Sir? could this, this is made of natural components. Is it possible for a pen to make itself? Or does this require a designer, whether I ever meet the guy or not? Would you say it's logical to say this had a designer? Yes. Anybody would. It's also logical to say the human eye had a designer and the ear had a designer. It's perfectly Why? logical. Why is the question. Why? What? what makes the eye similar to the pen? That's the question I'm asking. The complexity oh. is millions of times, an eyeball is millions of times more complex than a pen. So it's complex. You know, it's all key. Key. I had a designer. I don't think I can help somebody like that, Matthew. This is key. So complexity for you is the differentiating factor. But you believe everything was designed. So you believe a rock was designed. You believe the human eye was designed. One is more complex than the other. So clearly complexity cannot be the hallmark of design for you. Okay. I think all human observation from everybody on the planet that's ever lived would tell you nothing cannot create something. Matter has to have, matter exists, the pen exists, my body exists, the bottle of water exists. No, it, Nobody has ever seen something come from nothing. So I would have to say there are no, science deals with what we observe, study, test, and demonstrate. We only observe things come from either a manufacturer or they already exist and the molecules are rearranged. They took the hydrocarbons and rearranged them to make the pen. We don't ever observe ink pens or hydrocarbons or anything coming from absolutely nothing. So what is the answer? How did we get here? How did the world get here? Where did time, space, and matter come from? In your religion, how did life and matter get started? How did we get here? I already the only know. logical answer is there has to be a designer. I don't happen to know how to prove it to you right now. But there, that's the only logical answer. I already had multiple answers in my slides. That's the least parsimonious explanation. You got nothingness, then sky wizard, then universe, three steps. Nothingness, universe, two steps. Occam's razor wants this one. Well, you keep referring to God as a sky wizard. You seem to have some kind of particular hatred for the Christian God. Uh, it shows up in your verbiage. Uh, it's not a sky wizard. This is the God of the universe who designed everything. I currently can't understand that. I don't think the human brain could contain an infinite God. Uh, if your three pound brain can contain an infinite God, you're a whole lot smarter than I am because I don't comprehend. I don't comprehend what gravity is. I can show you what it does. I taught physics. I can teach quite a bit about gravity, but I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you what love is. I can't give you a jar of that. I can tell you it exists. There are lots of things we cannot, you can't, nobody knows what light is. We use it all the time. We can refract it and reflect it and all that kind of stuff and tell about the different colors and wavelengths and measure them. But we don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. That science deals with what we know, we can observe and study and test. What we've ever, all we've ever seen is dogs produce after their kind. Dogs produce dogs. There's no exceptions to that. Now, if you choose to believe that dogs came from nothing, which is probably what you do believe, that's not science. I don't think it's common sense either, but it's certainly not science. 
to say thing, life, we're here, we exist. How did we get here? Your choices are Occam's razor, a sky wizard made us, or no, nothing made us. And you're choosing the nothing. I think that's ridiculous. You, know, you, you reject Occam's razor? Oh, I think Occam's razor is great. I think it says, if I see this pen, if I find an arrowhead or anything, any object, the nut and bolt, is this happened by chance or was it designed? Well, let's, why don't we use the example on the table? Nothing, sky wizard, universe, nothing, universe. Let's go. Which is Occam's razor prefer? Well, that's, that's not the only choice. That's like saying our elephants are green or blue. They're neither one, okay? There's another choice. A loving God instead of a sky wizard. Why don't you call him a loving God created everything? That's one fully option. Coalesced, invisible miracle work. Fully coalesced. It came out of nothing completely in its finished form. And it had the ability to create universes. That is a yeah. uh, that is a more complex explanation than a bunch of random particles spewing out. So do you believe nothing created everything, you know, including the order, including the laws of the universe, like the law of gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, a pendulum, et cetera. All those laws were in this nothing. And Where did this nothing come from? Nothing, and then the nothing created God. And then oh. God created all the laws. Ah, there's your problem right there. You think God had to be created. You, you're, you're thinking of a very tiny God that exists inside time, space, matter. See, my God is outside of time, space, matter. He actually created time, space, and matter. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to try to understand, wow, this is amazing. And I'll try to get the message to you wherever you are at that time. Wow, God, you're amazing. I don't have a problem falling down and worshiping a God who's way beyond me. He's outside of time, space, matter. I don't know why you don't want to worship a God like that. You want to limit him down to a God that has to have a beginning himself. In your mind, God is stuck in time. I bet you think this is 2019 up in heaven. Matthew, God's already been to your funeral. There's no time in heaven. God is outside of time, space, and matter. He created those in 10 words in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, matter. God made time, space, matter. And he wrote a book and told us how he did it. If you choose not to believe it, that's fine. But I object to people like you wanting to teach that stupid idea to kids in public school. Go start a private school and teach, teach nothing made us. Teach that to anybody who wants to pay and come learn it. Something but it should that, not be in public schools. That's a stupid idea. Something that exists outside of time, space, and matter looks very much like something that does not exist. How can you demonstrate something that exists out of time that's not within time, space, or matter? And in fact, your God must be reaching into time when he's giving Moses the Ten Commandments and flooding the world and killing everybody but eight people. Was he in time, space, and matter then? God can go in. He created time, space, matter. We can go in and out. This, the guy who made this computer is not in the computer. Well, he's he's not running around here changing the number. He's in the time. So he's both. God can do whatever he, the God that I worship can do anything. He could stop time. He could stop the sun. He can flood the world. He can do anything he wants. He can raise the dead. He can feed 5,000 men plus women and children with one little boy's sack lunch. And he was not caused. He came out of nowhere. No, he didn't come. Just the phrase came indicates he's stuck in, in space. He just is. How does this work? God How does this work then? How do you not? I don't know. I, 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 I work. I move to summary judgment for the plaintiff. He, the, my opponent has admitted he does not know how anything he teaches works. The most fundamental question of his entire religion about the origin of the universe, he has no clue of how it happened. I have a great clue. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. As far as the origin of the universe, that's not a problem. God made it. As far as the origin of God, that's I, nobody knows. I, but I think even the question is invalid because you're assuming he had to have an origin. He if didn't. That question he is invalid, then why can't I say other things don't have origins? Is it invalid to say what is the origin of the universe? You can say whatever you want, Matthew. Okay, so maybe, maybe the universe came from nothing. So then we're back to nothing, God, universe, nothing, universe. Occam's razor wants this one. Well, there's a third choice. Okay. How about beef? instead of nothing, forget the word nothing, God created the universe, or the universe just is. That's Occam's razor. Oh, yeah, that's, you, that's even better. God which is more logical. Man made the pen or the made the pen. Now we have two versus one. Universe is eternal on this side. Uh, God, then eternal universe. Great. 
you're still assuming the universe is uh, eternal, has is stuck in time. I'm you're still assuming you squeeze God into a box that God is stuck in time. You don't get it, do you? You're you really don't get it. it. I marvel at guys like you. You're just asserting it. This is called argument by assertion. If I were to say to you, the universe is is timeless, spaceless, et cetera, and then when you refute that, me saying you just don't get it, it's not proving your point. You're just you're just saying a bunch of words. I did not say the universe is timeless and spaceless. I said well, God. If I were to say that, God is outside of time, space, matter. The we are you and I are stuck in time, space, matter. You can't go back two seconds. Can you prove that? Can you prove that God is outside of time, space, and matter? No, the Bible simply declares that. Okay. And I, I take that on faith. But I admit my belief in God, an eternal outside the box God, is a religion, and I believe it. You guys believe nothing made the universe, and, the, and this nothing turned into all the complex things we see today. That's like saying nobody made this wrench because it's made out of molecules of metal. That's ridiculous. It's not common sense. What you don't realize, and maybe you'll realize it when you rewatch this tape, is that you've admitted on two separate occasions that you take what you, your beliefs are based on faith, which is belief without evidence. So you've already conceded the debate. Oh, don't well, I don't it. think faith is belief without evidence. I have overwhelming evidence that somebody made this ink pen. I'm holding it. I don't know who. I don't know where. I don't know, you know, exactly what they made it out of. It probably could analyze it and find out. But somebody made it. I'm holding the evidence. You are the evidence, Matthew, of a creator. You, you look at the complexity of your body. Pluck a hair off your, you pluck a hair off your back if it bothers you, and look at that hair under the microscope, and you'll say, "Wow, this hair is amazing." Do you think the hair that you have on your body came from nothing? I'm going to answer the question right now. We've already been over this. Complexity cannot be the hallmark of design because you believe in both simple and complex creations. Well, my God can create anything how he wants. He can create things to be created. Complexity is out. Complexity is out as a, as a hallmark of design. In your mind, it is, not in mine. It's I think true. complexity is amazing. Okay, which is more complex, a rock or a human body? Well, if you look at the molecules in the rock, I think you maybe you maybe have to marvel. Like, whoa! It depends what kind of rock it is, of course. But they're, they're just the elements, the electrons whizzing around the nucleus of every single element are stunning. Don't the electrons ever get tired? They go around millions of times in a billionth of a second and never get tired. Where did this energy come from for the electrons to whiz around the nucleus of the rock? All right, a, a piece of pumice or shale the size of my phone versus my body, which is more complex. I didn't say, hear the question again. What was it? A, a piece of pumice or shale or something, a rock or the size of my phone or my body, which is more complex? That would be a tough question to answer. They're both incredibly complex. Which is more complex, mm -hmm. uh, a Toyota or a Honda? Uh, they're both pretty complex, you know? You don't know. <coughs> I would say a rock. A rock is, I'll tell you what, make a rock from nothing. Get all the scientists in the world and start with a jar of nothing and make a rock out of it. I want to see that. The question wasn't answered again. The question was evaded. I asked which is more complex, a rock I, something with my phone? It there is, there is no simple answer to that question, your honor. And be, by the way, that's the honor up there. I think we have a fellow here who's determined to not believe there's a designer at all. And he's using completely illogical arguments. He's designing arguments against design. It, that, I think it's ludicrous. I guess, yeah, they're, they're so illogical that you won't even attempt to answer them because you can't. So, again, a, a rock the size of, you know, let's say pumice, shale, I don't care what type of rock it is, the size of my phone or my body, which is more right. complex. If you can't tell me which is more complex, then you can't judge complexity. So you can't judge design if you're using complexity as your hallmark of design. Is that the kind of arguments you use in court, Matthew? Can you answer the question? <laughs> really not. This is so far off. This is in, people are going to watch this and comment. They're going to make fun of you, Matthew. Okay, I'm trying to help you. you I think a rock. You're going to make fun of you. Let me answer the question. A rock the size of your cell phone or my cell phone mm -hmm. would be incredibly complex. It would have more molecules and atoms in there than you can imagine. It would have quadrillions, quintillions. Uh, decillions of molecules and atoms in a rock that big, each one of those made up of whatever elements are in that particular rock. Each of those elements has a nucleus, a proton, a bunch of protons, a bunch of neutrons, and has electrons whizzing around with apparently infinite energy. The electrons don't seem to ever get tired. And they can interact with each other and connect with each other and make crystals. 
So I would say a, a rock would be really complicated. Now the human body, I would say would probably even more complicated, but they're both beyond dazzlingly complex. You so, finally answered the question. It took, it took all that to get for you to, to compare them based on degree. Okay, great. And they're going to laugh at me. Nice at home. I would say I believe the human body is more complex than a rock, but a rock is really complex. So there, okay, it's, so there's levels of complexity. So then if some things are more complex than others, how is it you determine which ones are designed and which ones aren't? If complexity is the hallmark of design. Well, I think com common sense intuition, all of human experience says, this is made by a man. The rock is probably not made, made made by a man. I think, but the rock is evidence of a designer outside of man. The dirt, which you don't seem to see any use for, is, you, you couldn't be eating anything. All the animals eat plants or eat animals that eat plants. I mean, it all goes back to the dirt. I mean, dirt is really important for this planet. And so dirt is has to be designed. It's got amazing, it has bacteria in it that are designed to break down certain components so that the plants can absorb them. Bacteria is designed for amazing purposes. Now, can it be misused? Sure, you can take a rock and melt it down and get the lead out and put it into a bullet and shoot somebody in the head. That's a misuse of the rock. But it, still, the rock is useful. You can misuse a hammer and beat somebody on the head with it. You can misuse all kinds of things. And they can. And if I was God, I would give a book that says, hey, if you want to live a long time and be healthy, do these things. Don't touch a dead body. When you go out in the woods to take a dump, take a shovel and bury it. That's one of the laws God told his people. And here, the all, whole, all of Europe was disobeying God's simple law about sanitation. And they, they got bubonic plague. You can't blame God for that. They disobeyed his clear commands. If a doctor in the hospital doesn't wash his hands and get, spreads a disease to somebody else, he'll get sued and lose his medical license and probably his, all his money and go to prison for not following common sense medical practice, common medical practice. God gave it to us in a book, Matthew, 3,000 years ago, or 3,500 years ago. He told him what to do. Don't quit blaming God for this kind of stuff. Okay, well, that was a lot of tangential thoughts and word salad, but I'm going to tell you why I don't use complexity to uh, decide what is designed and what isn't. Because a hammer and my laptop have varying levels of complexity, but they're both man-made. Now, in fact, I think you, I, although I wouldn't argue this, I, there are many philosophers, including, well, da Vinci's not a philosopher, but he argued that simplicity is actually the hallmark of design, because then there's less things that can go wrong. Now, I don't, I don't use that argument because, like I said, the hammer is, is designed and it's much simpler than my laptop. They're both designed. So, again, the way that I do it, direct observation, that's out. Standardization, which you haven't addressed. Why, do, why is every organism, why aren't they on the assembly line? Why is everyone a snowflake? And if, and if some features are, are good for an unknown purpose, like back hair, why do only men have it and not women? And then you, utility. You still said you have no idea what the plague germ uh, utility is. So I'm pretty sure this is over. Okay. <laughs> well, you can believe whatever you want. As far as is a hammer more complex than a uh, cell phone? Oh, probably the hammer is much simpler than a cell phone. But you don't use a cell phone to pound nails. Try to pound a nail with your cell phone, and you'll say, well, I'd rather have a hammer to pound this nail in. Now, if you want to talk on it, I don't think you can talk in your hammer. I think probably you're going to need a cell phone for that. So the fact that some things are more complex than others is a ludicrous argument for anything. Both are designed for different you're purposes. Making it. I just specifically said I don't use that argument because some things are simpler than others. But you're the one saying complexity is the hallmark of design. And I think the hammer is complex. Get a get a atom of get a molecule of iron and look at it under the microscope. How does the ham? How do all those molecules stay together so they adhere to each other so strongly that you can pound nails with them and they don't break apart? Complexity is in the eye of the beholder, but you've already admitted that right. there's a level of complexity. So you can't yep. because there are tiers of complexity. You can't use it as the defining factor. Don't you understand the point of distinguishing between two things? If they have a, something in common, you can't use that. I, I can distinguish between a hammer and a cell phone, Matthew. Not a problem. I, I don't know. You, I'll, but I'll, you I'll don't use the level of complexity, do you? Because you agree that they're both designed by people, and one is more complex than the other. I think people design some simple things, like nails, and they design some complex things, like cell phones. They're but both designed. By complexity is a defining factor because you agree that they're one is more complex than the other, but they are both designed by people. Okay. Do you think a nail had an intelligent designer? Yes. Do you think a hammer had an intelligent designer? Yes. Do you think your eyeball had an intelligent designer? No. 
Okay. I think we're out of time anyway. I, I can't help you, Matthew. I'm sorry. If you don't see the eyeball having an intelligent designer, I can't help you. Uh, I'll pray for you. And come on down, visit Dinosaur Adventureland. I'll give you a tour of the place. But we are teaching kids real science here. And lots of teachers are using my videotapes on creation in their public school classroom. Actually, there are public school libraries that have my videos. Kids can check them out. There's no law against that. And there shouldn't be. There ought to be a law against lying to kids. Do you think, do you think textbooks that teach... Uh, evolution and use lies to support that? Do you think those lies should be banned? Not the evolution. Should we still teach the kids the embryo has gill slits proven wrong in 1874? That's in the textbooks in Connecticut. I've seen it. Are you working to get that out of the textbooks, Matthew? That's a bold-faced lie proven wrong in 1874. Are you working to get that out? Or are you just working against guys like me who want to teach kids, hey, there might be a designer? Which do you hate more? Lies in your local textbooks or guys like me in Alabama that have no effect on you? I will promise you this. I don't care what type of inaccuracy it is. If it's an inaccuracy of any sort, I don't want it to be taught. But I'll also say, good, good. Watch my video, video four and help get those lies out. That's all yeah, I ask. As a, uh, yeah, uh, I know we're just out of time, but uh, <laughs> you mentioned sure. Dinosaur Adventureland. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention I just had to. It's irrelevant. But your uh, video on 422 about Tyrannosaurus rexes using their little vestigial arms to eat pumpkins. And you thought that that might actually occur. You want that taught in schools? Or no, you don't, right? That, that, you tell me, Matthew, what did the T-Rex use those little arms for? Nothing. Or, well, I shouldn't say that. We're not sure, but it might have been nothing. So you're not sure what they used them for? How would we be? We weren't there. Good. I rest my case, Your Honor. He doesn't know. All right. Thank you oh, so much. Come visit us. You want to give a closing word and tell people how to get a hold of you, or you don't want them to get a hold of you? Oh, they can get a hold of me. I, I don't know why they would, but uh, my okay. name is Matt Bardos. I'm an attorney in Connecticut. Uh, you can my, my email is Matthew with two T's, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, middle initial R, Bardos, all one word, at gmail.com. Be happy to talk to anybody and answer their questions. Okay. And come on down to Alabama. I'll give you a tour of Dinosaur Adventure Land. Thank that you so much for joining us, folks. Uh, tune into our channel and tell other people about it. Subscribe, all that kind of stuff, and join our 777 Club. Thank you for doing this, Matthew. This was very interesting. All right, Great. see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>